it is estimated that about 25% of the soils in the world are degraded, are in a severely degraded state. And we are talking about agricultural soils in particular, right? soils which are, we are using for cultivation. So that means that on the one hand, what we're doing is expand the footprint of agriculture by bringing more land from nature into agriculture. And at the same time, we're not taking care of the land that we're using already. Now, this is obviously a major problem, especially in a changing world, but it is also a major opportunity, because if we are able to actually restore fertility in these soils, restore the productivity, we can actually produce in 25% more land, and at the same time, sink a lot of carbon. Why? Well, because what it takes to restore these soils is to increase organic matter contents. And organic matter, as you may know, is 50% carbon. That means the many tons of organic matter you're going to need from there are going to be withdrawn from the air, from the carbon that is now causing climate warming. So it is actually a 5% deal to move from this situation to a situation like this. And why do I say a 5% deal? Well, because in most soils, organic matter occupies no more than 5% in natural soils, or the volume of the soil. Right? And here I have some samples where, where we, we can see that. We can see some, some elements of organic matter are going to be part of the soil later on. Normally, its soils have what we call pores. Only half of the volume of the, of the soil is solid. The other part is pore, porosity. That porosity is very important. It's the one that holds water and air. Without that, there is no life in the soils. There is no life for plants. There is nothing. Anything important that happens in the soil happens in the pores. It doesn't happen in the solid, solid phase. Right? Now, if we look now at the solid phase, most of it is mineral. Right? And the minerals that form the soil are actually depending on the type of geological material that gave origin to those soils. If we look at this map, we see in those, all those red areas, these are areas where we had very old rocks, very old, what we call Precambrian rocks. They're very old, older than the internet, for instance. And those soils actually have been weathered for a long time. That means that they lost a lot of nutrients, right? So the soils that form that rock are actually inherently poorer in nutrients, are acidic, right? And there isn't much we can do about that. We can't change the mineral phase of the soil, right? What we can do is work actually on the organic part of the soil, this 5%, right? And in this 5%, what we find is humus, and here I'd like to open a parenthesis for the soil scientists in the audience because I know it's more complicated than that, but let's keep it as, as this, as simple. Humus, that's most of it. Then we also have uh, roots of the plants, like we see in that picture. All these roots are going to die down and, and become organic matter in the soil. Then we have plant litter, like this, that's going to decompose and form organic matter. Actually, if you take a little bit of soil from here, you see some plant material still decomposing, right? And then what we have also in these soils, sorry for making a bit of a mess here, is, um, is organisms, right? Those organisms, some of them are really tiny. We can't see them. We need a microscope. Not for nothing, they're called microorganisms. And then there are many others that we can see, that right? we can actually see and, 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 and study and see their movements and see their activity. All these organisms are very important, and they need organic matter. They need organic matter as food for themselves, right? Without organic matter, they're not able to grow, they're not able to reproduce, they're not able to comply all the functions that we need from those organisms, like helping plants to actually acquire nutrients. Now, another important function of organic matter is to act like a cement, keeping particles together. What we have here is what we call, sorry for this, soil aggregates, right? Aggregates. So actually, it's the spatial organization of the particles of the soil, which are cemented thanks to organic matter. Now, the existence of these aggregates is very important because this is what creates porosity right, in the soil. And that's, as I said before, anything important that happens in the soil happens in the pores. If we actually destroy that porosity by compacting this, then nothing else happens in the soil. We can put a lot of nutrients there, but they're not going to be available for the plants. Right? And the existence of a good structure, it's called soil structure, can be also evidenced when we put these soils in water, right? What we have here is a glass of water where we put this soil, which has a lot of organic matter, and the water looks clean, right? I feel like taking a sip, even. And here we put another soil that has less organic matter, and the water 
gets dark, disturbed. And that's because there's less cohesion between the particles of the soil. So when it rains, and this happens, then this water carries away a lot of nutrients. So this is important to know because soils, when we put soils into production, the first thing we do is we destroy that structure, right? By working on it. But we also change the vegetation cover, and that means that we expose the soil to sunshine, to rainfall, we change the conditions in the soil. And what we are doing there is creating what we call oxidation of organic matter. Oxidation means that the organic matter is being decomposed and turns into CO2, contributing to global warming. That's how agriculture contributes to global warming. And interestingly, when I teach this to my students, I normally use this analogy of a reservoir. If you have a reservoir, and the soil is a reservoir, and, and the water is the amount of organic matter, actually, the amount of organic matter you can store in the soil is a, is a balance between what comes in and what goes out. If you open the outlets and reduce the inlets, then you're going to have less water, less organic matter. This is exactly what we did in the last century. We've been opening the outlets by plowing the soils and exposing them to oxidation. And we've been reducing the, in, the inlets by using less organic fertilizers and also varieties which are smaller and produce less biomass than before. So we've been doing this. And also, next to that, there's a problem of erosion that is also accounting for a lot of losses of organic matter. Now, when we think about the solutions to, to soil problems, especially in the case of Africa, we think about fertilizers obviously, because nutrient is, nutrients are limiting productivity in Africa. Yeah. And we think that actually by making fertilizers available, we're going to solve the problem. Now, when we talk to farmers, as I did for, for, for almost 10 years now, the situation is a bit different. In the first place, because indeed fertilizers are very expensive to farmers. Farmers in Africa may pay 10 times more what a European farmer pays for fertilizers. But on the other hand, what they tell you is, well, if I use fertilizers, they will make my soil hunger, hungry. And that, for a scientist, is a very challenging statement. How, how's that? Well, I mean, you know, if you use fertilizer once, you have to use it, keep using it, right? Well, that sounds very strange, right? but there may be a reason for that. Actually, when we look back in history, we can go back to the father of the fertilizer industry, or the father of modern agriculture, and he was actually well, he was also the inventor of these cubes, so he actually made a lot of money with that. But he was a brilliant mind, and he was the one who actually discovered nutrients in a way. Now, see, he made nutrient solutions, applied them to plants, and then he saw the plants growing better. And that's the creation of fertilizers in a way. Right? That, that was written in this book in 1840, but 20 years later, people say that when you become older, you become greener. He said something like this. Adding chemical mixtures to soil, he didn't call them fertilizers yet, without organic matter has, in the long term, the same effect that alcohol, well, he said brandy, actually, alcohol has on uneducated people. He said laziness, I said inefficiencies. Right? He was not very politically correct, or maybe for the time he was. Right? And actually, when you tell this to farmers, they say, look, you need just 5% of organic matter in your soil. Farmers sometimes say, well, you know, that's easy to say, but you know, if I need to apply organic matter, if I need to apply animal manure, first I need a cow. If I don't have a cow, so well, yeah, actually it's true. And when we look at the density of cattle in Africa, actually there are few places, only the red spots there, where you have enough cows to be able to maintain soil fertility only with animal manure. The rest of the places, there are not enough cows. So we can't count on this resource. Only the wealthier farmers have cows. So here is where conservation agriculture may help, right? Conservation agriculture may help by doing two things, reducing the outlet of organic matter, reducing the losses, and increasing the input of organic matter in the soil, right? Conservation agriculture is this combination of principles of minimum or no soil tillage, just don't move the soil, just keep it as it is, keep the structure, and open a little furrow, put your seed there, the second one is keep the soil covered, as in nature. In nature, the soils are always covered, either by plants or by mulch, by litter. And third, increase diversity of plants. Next to your crop, grow something else that is also giving organic matter to the soil. Right? And this other crop that you can in include can also be a legume. Legumes are plants of a certain family, a large family, that can actually form a symbiotic relationship with a small bacteria. 
The bacteria, they made their houses there in the roots, in their nodules. They make these nodules that we see here. They live down there and they take nitrogen from the air and they transform this. We have 14% nitrogen in this air and they transform it into a form that plants can take. That's exactly what the fertilizer industry does, right? So they use a lot of fossil energy to do that. They use energy that comes from the photosynthesis of the plant, and that's why it's a symbiosis. They use sugars to do that. Now, when you do this, when you, for instance, you have your maize, this is an example, this is an experiment in, in Mozambique that shows uh, a maize yield of one ton per hectare, which is, as, as you know, is, is, is a common uh, yield in many areas. When you combine your maize crop with a legume, in this case, a pigeon pea, it's a, it's a species that produces a lot of biomass and also produces peas that you can, you can eat them and that fixes nitrogen. Actually, what you get after intercropping, rotating, you get an increase in maize yield, but also a bit of, that, of those peas, which are also contributing to the diversified diets. Right? So there is potential, and actually we are underutilizing the potential of nitrogen fixation in agriculture. Now, in some situations, it's much more difficult, it's much more challenging. Even if we want to practice our, uh, our conservation agriculture here, this is a picture from Burkina Faso, from the Sahel, from a degraded soil. This is, this is actually an agricultural soil that has been degraded. And when we try to do that to produce biomass, to actually keep a mulch, we have lots of challenges there, right? Because it's difficult to grow a crop in the first place. If you, if you, if you try to, to generate organic matter, first you need to have a healthy crop with a lot of biomass. And if you put that biomass on top of the soil during the dry season, it will quickly disappear because of the composition, because of termites are going to eat it, or because cows may be, may be marauding around and eating it. But when you start doing things that farmers did in the past, like creating these micro depressions where you can concentrate water and you can concentrate nutrients, organic matter, and biological activity, then you start having, after some time, a recolonization of the area with the natural vegetation. Right? And now, once you have those plants there, all that biomass, natural biomass, you can use it as a source of mulch. Right? And now your nutrient inputs are going to actually respond much better. All over the, the, the world, we see farmers coming up with very inventive ways of managing soils and keeping organic matter. Farmers in the Andes, 3,000, 4,000 meters, they come together to work in these very harsh conditions with very steep slopes. And, of course, they know that the way to maintain these soils is to avoid erosion. And for that, they come with very innovative ways of actually cultivating the land. Very often we go there to those places and we propose farmers to adopt technologies that were developed for the flatlands, not for those soils, right? We come with our tractors and, and everything else. Well, actually, you can, you can actually develop a machine that does that, these interesting furrows that slow down the water and reduce erosion, right? So it's not that we don't need tractors or any other technologies. What we need is a combination of both, right? In fact, most of the technologies that we have in agriculture are technologies that were developed for these kind of systems. Right? There is a lot of investment, there is a lot of technologies, there is a lot of knowledge, and of course the, the GDP of this sector is very important. Right? But if we look at who is feeding the world, and if we look at who are the ones who actually are hungry, when we say these you know, numbers like 800 million people are going hungry, well actually lots of them are farmers, they have land. Right? And when we think about this agriculture, we immediately think about how many calories we can produce per hectare, and how many people, therefore, we can feed in one. But actually, we should think about how many people can make a living out of one hectare of land, because those are family farmers. They need to make more than just calories. Right? So that's why we need to put more science, more technologies, more knowledge into this kind of systems. Comparatively to the other system, we have invested less in understanding and trying to develop technologies which are adapted to these kind of systems. These kind of systems, these kind of very diverse systems, we call them agroecological systems, are actually not only feeding people, making a living for people, but also delivering ecosystem services of global importance. They are contributing to sequester carbon, they are contributing to preserve biodiversity, they are contributing to regulating water, so they are contributing to life on the planet. They should be rewarded for that as well. It is important to realize that 
it is a 5% yield. The difference between this and this is just 5%. Right? And of course, it is a challenge. Of course, organic matter is not something you can pack and transport and deliver. And of course, there are no recipes. You can't just say, well, all farmers should do this or this or that. We need to find locally adapted solutions. And then the, the best way to do that is to actually include farmers in the technology development. Right? What we need is a dialogue, a dialogue of wisdoms. Scientific wisdom, on the one hand, and farmer wisdom, on the other hand. We're not going to solve the problem if we think that we have the solution and we want to take it down there. Thank you very much.